as fact, you were at Ohio University, your role is both in your research, service, and teaching. So I, I play a part in all three of those. Um, teaching here at the College of Medicine, um, my background being in microbiology, so my, res my research has been focused on viruses for you know, the last uh, 30, 35 years or more. Um, and when I arrived here, my interest was mostly in looking at um, trying to understand how viral genes were regulated once they infected cells. And that has evolved since, I've evolved since then into working collaboratively with a number of individuals looking at specifically Coxsackie virus and this potential role as an environmental trigger of type 1 diabetes. But so in general, you know, I teach um, here in the college. My, my expertise or my teaching specialty is virology. So it is in that capacity that I speak about coronavirus. Um, but my work has mostly been Coxsackie virus and adenoviruses related. To really speak about coronavirus, I'll make a general statement about viruses in, a statement about viruses in general. So viruses are parasites, but they're different than bacteria or any other parasitic disease in that we refer to them as obligate intracellular parasites. And what that simply means is that a virus must infect a cell. So if I, as I often say to students, if I have a virus and a bacteria, I lay them both on a piece of you know, on, on some nutrient, the bacteria will grow and divide and replicate and produce more bacteria. The same would not happen with that virus. That virus has to attach to a cell, enter the cell. And once it enters the cell, it becomes an intracellular parasite. So it has to be inside before it can replicate and produce more virus particles and then exit that cell, killing that cell, often killing that cell, spreading to neighboring cells, etc. So all viruses do that. They're just parasites that are genetic material that enter the cell, take it over, reprogram it to produce more viruses. A coronavirus does the same thing, except that corona, like other viruses, so viruses are divided into large families. So coronavirus belongs to a family called coronaviridae, and there are many viral viruses within that family. So corona happens to be one of them. So when you think of coronavirus, there are multiple kinds of corona. So, for example, we heard of SARS. So SARS is actually a severe acute respiratory syndrome caused by a coronavirus, which is now called SARS-CoV, uppercase C, lowercase O and V, for coronavirus. So SARS caused by coronavirus. There's MERS, which is the Middle Eastern respiratory syndrome, and that is now referred to as MERS-CoV. MERS coronavirus. This virus is new, hence, and not much is known about it. So it's termed N, lowercase n, CoV, or novel coronavirus. So coronaviruses come in many flavors. And believe it or not, the common cold, that we suffer 25% of common cold, are caused by coronaviruses. So there are four endemic viruses. When we say endemic, they're present within the population that cause the common seasonal common cold and the coronaviruses, 25% of those colds that we suffer. So coronaviruses are not new. They're just, this novel virus is just a new one that resembles, it's more in line with SARS rather than MERS. And so the, the virus is kind of a novel new, what we'll call an emerging new viral infection. And, and that tends to happen over time. This is an emerging, um, emerging threat. So not much is known about this virus. And I'll touch a little bit more on that. But it, it, I think SARS was, the mortality rate was about 10%. Um, MERS, which is a Mediterranean, uh, Middle Eastern virus, I think was 37%. And, and this, so far, the, the rate is expected to be about 2%. Right now it's about 2%. So it's no more deadly than SARS, nor MERS, okay? It's just that whenever it makes the news, something makes the news, 
we get excited, get concerned, etc. But right now, I mean, when you compare that to influenza, the, the mortality rate for influenza, which is about 0.1%. So it's high compared to influenza, but no higher than MERS or, or SARS. So um, I would say the Spanish flu, which was in 1917, I think, Spanish flu epidemic, that rate was somewhere around, uh, I think, some say 10%. But I, I, I think it was between 2% and 5% and 10%. So, you know, when you compare them, it is just that the excitement about it and the concern is that we don't know much. And that's what's raising a lot of ire. Because this is an emerging threat and not much is known, what we're well, the CDC.gov, which is kind of the go-to site, I'll repeat that, you know, CDC.gov, you can find um, information for laymen, for scientists, etc. And that's a good place to really get a good foundation, and, and, and they keep updating it as they go, as new information comes out. They believe it's spread um, by contact, human contact. So sneezing, uh, coughing, respiratory droplets. So that six foot distance that they think is a good, is, a, is with, within the, the space that if one were to sneeze or cough, um, that one would be able to spread that. So it's human to human. But all coronaviruses that we've known about so far, human coronaviruses, actually are, zo sorry, are zoonoses. And what that means is they're spread from animals. So cats, bats, MERS, which is the Middle Eastern version, actually the virus comes from camels. So it's camels, cats, bats, rats, cattle. Um, so that's, the, that's where it spreads from, you know, from the, from the animal to humans, and then after that it's human to human. We're not quite sure, I haven't seen any information that says that if the virus, la if you sneeze or cough on a surface, and then you were to, you know, get your hands into that virus and then into your nose or eyes or mouth, that, that that's a way to spread it. But that's not, it hasn't been eliminated, but the possibility is that that's one of the ways it spreads. But mainly, it's coughing and sneezing, respiratory droplets, etc. And again, um, when we think of all of these viruses, um, the MERS and SARS, both um, are zoonoses that started in bats, you know. And since 2004, there really has not been another case of SARS. So it's possible that you will see the same kind of things happening because the virus tends, tends to be seasonal. They tend not to survive well in heat and humidity. And so maybe during the summer, one of the, 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 the thoughts is that as uh, you get into the summer season of heat and humidity, you will see a kind of a dying off of the virus. Um, and better control. The epidemic is, is contained within China at this particular point. So what the CDC is recommending is that non-essential travel to China not be undertaken. But there is no concern currently uh, about travel to other places. So if people are concerned, there's a website, and I think it's called uh, Travel Health Notice is the, is the website you can go to. So I'd encourage people who are traveling and concerned, go to Travel Health, or the other places also go to that country's website and see what the recommendations are. It's pretty much uh, China, and you know, so the concern is not, uh, I don't think there's much concern for people traveling at this particular point. But I would keep paying attention. You know, this is this is evolving, as I said. So I would keep going to, to you know CDC.gov, and like I said, there's information there for lay for laypersons as well as scientists, and they keep you know even the testing, um, novel ways of the new tests that are um, for a virus only CDC performs it. So if something happens at a site in Athens or any place else. That information has to, that, those samples have to go to the CDC. Um, so 
the CDC will, you know, you can contact them, they'll tell you how to handle the samples, how to get it to them, and they're the ones who use the new testing um, methods.